evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater, the largest single-screen drive-in in the United States. We're certainly glad you could be with us this evening. And don't forget the concession stand is open with all kinds of great things to eat and drink. Eighty-nine point three Mahoning Drive-In Radio. Your old friend Virgil back once again for another exciting episode of the podcast, the only podcast dedicated to the revival of our beloved drive-in culture. And uh, we got a really fun one today. Of course, I got my co-host, general manager extraordinaire, Mark. Say hello, my friend. I didn't even know I was French. Hello. (laughs) Lady. (laughs) And we have, uh, it's going to be a family reunion. We have some friends in the house joining us on the podcast, but we want to put out a, a spoiler for you guys. Well, I guess it's not a spoiler. I guess a special announcement because we weren't expecting Troma to share uh, their date so soon, although it makes sense. But uh, the Troma Dance slash Tromathon event has been leaked. Uh, the date will be July 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. They have Sunday this year. And the idea is we're going to go full blown triple features on Friday, Saturday, and the film festival, the Shorts Film Festival, AKA Troma Dance on Sunday and have a big blowout on the 24th. So I know we have a lot of people who listen to this podcast who are creatives, filmmakers per se, perhaps. So wanted to share with you guys the way to possibly get your film up on the big, massive Mahoning screen. You could submit your videos, features, shorts, music videos, anything that you do to Troma Dance at Troma.com and you see Lloyd up front and center in that poster. And he said, there's no way I'm missing this every single year. He fell in love with us. And this is kind of a great segue into who our guests are tonight. We are, we are inviting two members of our production team, key members of our production team in Mistress Zeneca and Sir John Demmer. Say hello, guys. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, how are Super you? Super excited to have you guys. Um, It's been a little while. The off season, when we can touch base with anybody uh, connected to the theater, it really warms our heart because it's like, uh, you know, we just don't don't have that connection. All of us are spread apart, doing our own things in our own worlds. And the Mahoning brings us together. And uh, how did the Mahoning bring you guys into the creative family? For me, I actually started going to the Mahoning for Zombie Fest in 2018 and just as a patron. And it wasn't until I saw the At The Drive-In documentary where I decided to really just offer my services. So in 2019 for the July 4th event, which was the Harry Potter. Yes. (laughs) Harry Potter Potter party. The yeah. cakes. The cakes, yes. Um, Sorry, not jumping ahead, but but I just I just remember that. And, and <laughs> it's I had infamous. A, a, a wave of pleasure came over me, so continue. So I made a huge cake. It was two foot by four foot, and it was a selection of four cakes. And since the Harry Potter event was four nights, it was going to be one cake per night. And each of the cakes were decorated as if they were parts of the Hogwarts shield so that each section of the shield had its own cake for that flavor for the house. It was amazing. Not only was the cake delicious, but it was like, that was early on. When did you say it was? 2019? Yeah, 2019, July 4th weekend. That feels so long ago. I mean, honestly, we've all lived like a lifetime in that that period, I guess. But (laughs) it was one of those situations where, you know, we all felt that you really brought something special to the table and literally shared it with the whole entire audience. It was like, hey, anybody want some cake? Anybody want some cake? And it was just amazing. Now, when did you start doing more of like the production stuff? Well, that came a little bit later. It wasn't until 2020, because in 2019, I did the cake and I talked to JT and I was like, I, I want to offer my services for whatever we need. And so it was in 2020. So I guess my first decor piece would be my car for the Mad Max event in, um, I think that was June 13th. Two years ago. Yeah. 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 Wow. So I, I had my blood bag at the front of my car and my car done up with spikes and everything and lights on it. And 
yeah, that was my first actual decor piece. I love that. Well, if anybody knows about decorating their car. <laughs> <laughs> um, John, when, when was your intro to the Mahoning as far as uh, the creative end? I know both of you guys, it should be said, are incredible supporters, fans, um, and now family at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater beyond being part of the production team, so. I learned about the Mahoning through the documentary the same way. It was 2019. Told Cindy and I love quirky documentaries. So we learned about it. said, we're going there. And of course, what happens in the beginning of 2020? The world ends. So we're like, wow, <laughs> this place isn't going to open and it's not going to happen. But then our first show was Wizard of Oz in 2020. You had a late start that year. That's right. Um, yeah. We came. I saw, I saw, you know, uh, uh, my brother was there when I didn't even know he was going to be there. Not Steve, my other brother, Eric. Steve was doing work for the Mahoning without even telling me. I didn't even learn about the Mahoning from my own brother who was doing crazy Ralph for years. And <laughs> I'm watching the documentary and all of a sudden I go, wow, Cindy, we got to tell Steve about this. And then this snippet comes up where he's pounding a sign into the lot. And I was so furious. I called him up. That should be mentioned that that Steve... John's brother, he did a lot of help with JT in those early years, um, him and Andrea, uh, oh. Andrea. It's incredible how those, you know, it, it's, I always say the Mahoning is its own bubble. Like you can, you can live in this world and then go back to your regular life. And that's a perfect example that somebody's brother <laughs> doesn't even, uh, you know, connect the, connect the dots there. Never even told me. So we, we come to Oz and you know how you can look back at a moment in time and say, oh, wow, that's how I got involved. Well, we're, we're leaving Oz, we're getting ready. And I think I must've said a five to seven second sentence to James. I just said, Hey, I'm a carpenter. If you ever need help with anything, let me know. That was <laughs> your first done, mistake. Done. Oh, oh, I must have not even hit Seneca Road before my <laughs> phone is ringing off the hook. He's like, well, we got this thing coming up, you know, this trauma thing. And they wanted me to do the sign for it. So that that was my very first thing, actually. So you mentioned trauma coming up. That was the very first thing I did was the big wood sign uh, for trauma, which actually I I'm, appreciate you guys have actually kept it and used it for the last two years. Oh, it's amazing. We're going to use that until that thing like falls to the ground. <laughs> and even then, I'm sure you'll be able to uh, repair it right back up. That's right. Yeah, it's it's God, that's incredible, you know, because it really does feel like you guys have been kind of part of the crew for so long. There's a lot of regular faces at the Mahoning, but, you know, you guys feel like you've especially been able to show us that love and now getting involved. What are some of the uh, the fond memories? Have you guys have you guys worked on things together? Yes, uh, the 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 trauma whale. You, uh, Zeneca could tell you more about that, but that was our <laughs> first. That was our real major thing for us. Why don't you tell them about that? That was last year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the trauma whale uh, was a seven foot, one third scale uh, version of an orca tail. So it was seven feet long. It was huge, made out of foam and wood. And I was just happy that when we actually put it on the wall, it did not fall off. <laughs> <laughs> this thing was massive. Oh, it's huge. It's huge. It was the largest um, sculpture that I had done to date. Um, and that's including the season opener Wizard of Oz Emerald Gateway. The whale, it's designed to actually be a shitting whale. You know, water <laughs> is supposed to go through this thing. And my job was I was to make the whale and then input the tube that goes from the anus to, you know, where it's going to match up to the wall. And then John takes it over from there to connect the plumbing to make sure that the water can go through it. And then Doug was supposed to provide the diarrhea and the, the <laughs> sub pumps and all of that. This is high level art, folks. <laughs> We make dreams come true at the Mahoning. And uh, a little backstory there <laughs> for those who aren't familiar. The Troma event last year in 2021, their big premiere, their big film of the year was a film called Shakespeare Shitstorm, which featured, um, as Zen Zeneca put so bluntly, <laughs> a shitting whale, a, a, a shitting whale and the uh genius production crew I don't, who even came up with the idea of like we can do this okay 
All right, so my idea was I was going to have this whale tail, which was smaller than the final product turned out to be. But I have a circle, kind of like a photo display stand thing that I was going to decorate it with clear and uh, blue resin so that it was actually a moment captured in time of the whale diving in and you, and the splash of the water coming oh, up. Oh, yeah. And then from the anus, I was going to have a fan and then crepe paper attached to the back end. So oh, it yeah, was, makes total sense. Yeah. And, and then then JT took that idea and like, well, well, what if we put this in a way that it's more of a selfie station? Because the sculpture was meant to be a 360 in the round sculpture. Like it's diving into a pool of water type of thing. Right. And if we tilted it and put it on the wall and then I don't know who came up with the actual water being put into it, but yeah. It, <laughs> so I, it, it went I, from an easy breezy idea with a fan and some like paper mache yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. to, to, yeah, let's, let's make this as realistic and insane as possible. And the whole thing <sighs> was supposed to be lit up. So the resin was going to have the light travel through the resin. So the splash was illuminated at night. And then I have a water effect. It water effect lights that I would put on it at night so that it looked like it was actually, you know, reflecting off of water. It was going to be beautiful. <laughs> what turned out was beauty in a way different fashion. Well, as we said, when Sharoma comes to town, we have to get a little bit gross and a little bit naughty. That's just, that's just how it goes. Now <laughs> we'll get to John's background, but where, like, where does this creativity come from? Because I look at you, Zeneca, as kind of a jack of all trades, you know, like sculpting, projecting, yeah. also, you know, working with your hands uh, with really anything. So where does that come from? I'm actually an event planner at heart. I have been doing events since I owned a catering company at uh, 17. So I have been doing events practically my whole life. And, you know, my cake decorating skills, of course, all on fleek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But the actual uh, building and crafting of the props and, and things like that, it comes from just years and years of doing them for my own events. So my own events are typically over the top. And the last one I did before COVID was a vampire Valentine ball. And so everyone had such a blast. That makes total sense. You know, the idea of that crossover where... You know, the Mahoning, as much as we started as the traditional double feature house, you know, it's become more and more an event space. You know, the exhumed weekends are a great example in the early days of kind of shifting that gear into, you know, wh why don't we play three movies? Why don't, why don't we, uh, you know, add a little extra flair to this and that? And that kind of birthed everything that we're doing now, you know. I'm trying to think, James, what did he say? Because he was recently on. What was his first? Oh, Zombie Fest. That's right. He came and dressed up as a zombie for Zombie Fest in like 2015, 16. It's crazy. Now, John, what the, with your background, you, you mentioned it. You're a carpenter. Where does that all come from? I'm a carpenter by trade. So that kind of worked out well because, you know, JT, he's got such phenomenal eye for decoration and for uh you know the costumes that he does and, and the the amount of dedication that he puts into getting it just right but he he said to me he says i don't have much carpentry skills so maybe this is where we could pair up and do something and it's it's been terrific i mean the first really big thing after the trauma sign was the thing for bruce campbell for the cabin that was the biggest level up for us on so many points <laughs> including the sets you know that was huge for me too. So to go back real quick to the Trump sign, the thing that hooked me about the Mahoning was I had built the sign. I didn't know really what trauma was. I, I just made this sign because they needed the sign. And we're sitting at our car watching the movies and I hear noises behind me and I see people lining up at the sign to get the pictures taken. I, I nudge Cindy, I go, look at this. And, and that's when it hit me that I wasn't doing this necessarily for the theater or for myself or for whatever, is that people really, really enjoy this. This means something to people. So when, you know, James had mentioned that this big event with Bruce Campbell, he's going to come over. He goes, you know, the last event he was at, he was in a parking lot with two chairs with the window sitting on a chair. He goes, we've got to up this game. So that's when, I can't remember his name. You had the guy who had the actual window, which was phenomenal. 
Yes. James gave me all the details for the cabin. And then when I built the cabin, I looked down and go, oh, it just looks so new. It doesn't look right. And then James and his team up there, including my brother and Andrea, the way they decorated and aged it, it was, that's what hooked me. The whole thing came together. It wasn't, I wasn't responsible for making this show great. It was all of us coming together. And when everyone does what they have to do, it just, it was phenomenal. I mean, seeing him up there, the only panic moment is when that, remember, guys, remember that storm that came through? Oh, yeah. The, what, we'll be talking about that. That forever. tsunami that rolled through? Oh, uh, the tent was tied to the wall. And I, I said to Cindy, I said, you know, get the keys ready because we may end up killing Bruce Campbell if this thing doesn't <laughs> hold to the wall. We might have to get out of here right away. But luckily it held and everybody stayed in line. And that was that was a mind-blowing event. That was, that was one of the greatest. That's one of my favorites was doing that cabin which nicely has kind of remained around and, and comes back as an old friend sometimes because we've we've built a lot of things on top of it since and every now and then it it peers back out at me and it's like you know i'm still here so it's kind of like an old friend <laughs> well that's your carpentry right there at work that thing's not going anywhere that frame we have been using and still use and plan to use this year <laughs> it's uh it, it's just that's what i think the magic of the mahoning is is that that synergy you know bringing people together to entertain the people that are like-minded like yourselves you know your fans of, of what we do and it, it, it's just perfection do you guys have a favorite that you worked on i would probably say that my favorite is the season opener set that I did, which is the Wizard of Oz Emerald City Gateway plus the Candy Overboard Willy Wonka set. And I really enjoyed doing it. I spent all winter, year before last, designing it and painting it with six different colors of green, etc. I put a lot into it. So I have to say that that's probably my favorite, but I've done a lot of projections too. So I've projected things onto my car, onto my projection screens, different effects. During Camp Blood, I added fire to the campfire right. with my projections. So there's a lot that I've done that I've really enjoyed. But yeah, making making the Emerald City Gateway, I would have to say, is the most interesting. It was so immersive. It added so much to the event. And it can certainly be said that, and James even mentioned it on his podcast, he, he cannot take the weight of all of these events on his shoulder. You know, maybe he could have at one point but the idea of expanding and, and bringing the team together, I say this all the time. I've seen James grow. I've seen, in a weird way, Zeneca, like I've seen your art kind of grow at the theater too with, you know, at least bringing certain elements and skills to the shows that I we, none of us saw coming. That's the best thing <laughs> is in those early years, you know, uh, James, he wouldn't tell. I mean, I don't know if, you know, there was that uh, connection, but, you know, you'd show. I'm trying to think the trauma that must have been the very first trauma, the first show that John yeah. worked on. You did that backdrop that everybody knows the skyline when the, the VHS starts with the, the classic. Oh, music. yeah, the, the opening credits. Yeah. Yes. So that is basically a combination of me and uh, my fiance, Jason. And what we did is he sculpted the skyline out of cardboard. And it's, it's pretty big. It, it's probably about mm, six and a half to seven feet wide. And then around it is basically canvases. And so then when I project the opening credits, I match them up to the sculpture itself. And then around the outside edge, I will also put some fireworks or some additional graphics around it so that at first it's the just the crawl of the opening credits and then it flashes to the city basically in celebration. And I'm, I'm probably going to be bringing that back again out for this year. It makes total sense. That's the great thing about these annuals, you know, we, or, or, or I guess any event with, in John's case, since we use the... <laughs> the photo op stage pretty much every weekend so are you brewing anything for this season i mean has does james keep in contact with you guys on plans that he's got revving up for this year james and i are working on something right now that i don't think he released yet so i won't talk about it but there's something that we worked on that uh, that i'm already going to start to build because it's going to take a while to get it ready but it'll be it'll be something pretty cool actually for one of your uh, upcoming events 
And I think that I'm doing the season opener again. I didn't want to say it if <laughs> if it no, wasn't no, no. official. I was segueing into it. <laughs> yeah, it's just this time I'll probably be doing only inside the concession stand instead of outside. Uh, last year, the wind was so very intense that Wicked. some of the foam that the Emerald City is made out of, I really don't want crushed by the wind. And it was just the outside elements are getting to be a little bit more intense and therefore I don't want to risk it. Yeah. So yeah, everything will just be in the concession stand for season opener. I love it. And Wonka may show up again. We'll see. I mean, now it's expected, so we can talk about that a little bit. Beyond, let's talk about the fandom, beyond uh, you guys working on the creative stuff. So, John, you and your wife, Cindy, mega fans, even, like you said, before working on the sets, where do you think that comes from, your your fandom for, and wanting to wear your fandom on the sleeve? It's, it's weird. I mean, the whole idea, the Mahoney... <laughs> is interesting to me too, because here's here's another thing that you might not know. I started working when I was 15. I had my own company when I was 18. So these movies that you're showing, 90% of them I've never seen, which is a real extra treat for me because I'll be working on something and I'll have no clue what the heck's going on, but I know that I'm doing it for the fans. And, and, and one good example was Sleepaway Camp. I didn't know about that movie. I didn't know about the ending and all this thing and that everybody knows. So, you know, I'm walking around and I'm seeing things I don't quite understand. You know, Lisa's got an extension cord hanging out of her skirt and someone's got male genitalia under their a flap. And and I'm, you know, I'm I'm just I'm, I'm looking and I'm, you know, doing the make it till you fake it thing like, hey, that's that's a great idea. And I run back to the car and go, I don't know what the hell is going on here. And then <laughs> you see the movie and you see the ending and and you're like, oh, that's what it's all about. So the Mahoney is actually introducing me to things that you would think I had seen and I haven't. So the, the fandom comes from, I'm just having as much fun learning about these movies, which all you guys seem to know. And all these young kids are watching movies made even before I was born know about. And some, some most of these are the first time that I'm seeing them. So I do it for the fans. I, I, I bring it out there because I'm having fun. I want to share that fun with other people who may already know the movie or know what I'm, you know, know what the sets that I'm making, what they're for. But it's it's an interesting dynamic that I could be at this age and still having fun and learning this. Do you guys have like that history with drive-ins? I mean, beyond the Mahoning, did you guys? We've only, the first and only other, well, we, we went to about two drive-ins, but the first one we ever got introduced to was one, I'm sure you know most of these drive-ins, there's one up in Cape Cod called the Wellfleet. They still have the uh, speakers up and everything, but what's so different about the two or three that we've gone to versus the Mahoning is it's so different. When you go to a drive-in anywhere else, you drive your car in, you either sit in it or sit outside of it, you watch the movie and you go. What's so great about the Mahoning is what are the place you have the people coming in two hours ahead of time to shop for merch, to look at the sets, to discuss with their friends, to hang out, to have all this live cosplay going on. It's like a it's like a living museum up there. So it's it's so much more fun. I almost don't even want to call it a drive-in sometimes because the atmosphere is so different than anything else we've ever been to. Yeah, it's grown so much, you know, it feels more like an event space than, you know, a traditional drive-in. That that's the best way to put it. If you're going there for an event, not just for I can go anywhere and watch a movie. I can rent a movie, I can sit at home and watch a movie. And going to other drive-ins, I could sit in the car and watch a movie. But the Mahoning is an event. You're going there for the for the people. So did you yeah. not have any uh, drive-in experiences growing up? Or was it a more, more new experience for you? Cindy went to a couple drive-ins when she was young in our area for some reason. And I don't know why, because my parents were usually very outgoing people. My sister, I asked her, I said, did we ever go to a drive-in? And she said, no. So the first drive-in we ever went to was we were doing a vacation in Cape Cod maybe 20 years ago. And I heard about this thing called, the you know, the drive-in was still open. And that was the first one. And uh, so, no, growing up, not one experience with a drive-in. I've always wanted to go to the Wellfleet drive-in because I heard it's like really close to the water. Is it? Cape Cod is really close to the water. Okay. There's water everywhere. As opposed yeah. to the Mahoning, it's very close yeah. to the ocean. Yeah. Yeah. 
the only thing that's really the only thing I'll give the wealthy kudos for is they managed to keep their whole speaker system going. You drive up and you can pull a speaker off the stand and put it on your window. Wow. I love that. It's the only one I know. Look, I've been to a couple and I, it's the only one I know that still does that. That's got to be a lot of upkeep. What about you, Zeneca? Did you have that childhood experience with Travis? I did. I grew up in California. And so the drive-in that we used to go to was a discount drive-in that was a forest screen drive-in. I don't believe it's around anymore. And I remember being a kid, getting the concessions at this like puke green and yellow counter. <laughs> <laughs> and then during the movies, I would sit on the jungle gym because it was perfectly proportioned just off center of the entire place. So I could sit on the jungle gym and I would be able to see three out of the four movies very clearly. And then if I stretched a little bit, I would be able to see the fourth movie over uh, top of the it. concession stand. Yeah. So I don't remember any movie that I saw, but I know we used to go a lot. And for the most part, it was because it was only like $2 per person to get in and it was a cheap night out. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so then I love the drive-in because of that. And I've always been tied to movies of various forms, you know, from the silent film industry era to today. You know, films are just my bag. <laughs> Do you recall if the drive-in you went to as a youth was paved or had gravel? It was paved. Okay. It was paved and they used to have swap meets on the weekends. I've always found it interesting growing up in the New England area where the drive-ins were absolutely a seasonal endeavor, parts of the country where they could be year round. And oftentimes the, the images I've seen of California drive-ins are, you know, a paved lot, which is, is foreign to me. And uh, and the swap <laughs> meets and the, the making really good use of the space, you know, during the week and during the day when you, you normally can't obviously show movies. So that's, that's really kind of cool to hear a firsthand account of that. Yeah, we, we really enjoyed going. It's amazing how many times we ask that question and people just don't remember what they remember so vividly the experience, but the movies just like, it, it's not the recall. Cause that's normally the follow up is to say like, you know, what movies do you remember seeing at the drive-in, you know, growing up, do you have any movies that you do remember at all? Like, or, or is your kind of first blowback into drive-in fandom with us? At an actual drive-in, I don't have any that I remember. It's crazy. It's just, we used to go a lot, and I do remember that they were whatever was playing from the mainstream theaters like two months later. Like it was the tail end of whatever they were showing. And usually the movies weren't really important. It was that we would get out of the house for a little bit. And yeah. then I would fall asleep in the backseat of the car at some point, and then I'd wake up at home. So I... I don't remember any of the movies, but I think one of the first actual films that I do remember in a theater was actually a Buster Keaton film. Wow. Wild. I used to go to the silent movie theater before it shut down. Maybe that's what I'm thinking of. Yeah. I almost got married at that silent movie theater. So very wow. special for me. Silent films of all sorts and movies from the silent film era up until today. And I, I do celebrate all of it, although some genres are just not uh, what I'm into. I'm not into Westerns, yeah. so you'll never see me at a Western event. That's amazing. It, that theater experience definitely transforms a child, regardless of the drive-in experiences, if you're lucky enough to have peppered in there. But John, do you have any like standout memories at a theater, whether it's a drive-in or indoor, that kind of were standout? Yeah, I do, because this kind of also relates to the Mahoning in some odd way, is that we had a, a, a very nice 1927 movie palace kind of theater in town here in Nutley, where I live. And I remember seeing Star Wars with my dad, and we went up to, the, you know, it was a one-screen theater at that time, and we went up to the balcony and watched it. And to me, being up in the balcony for the first time was just an incredibly memorable event. And this this place was just so adorned with plaster work and gold leafing and all that. And years back before I became associated with Mahoney, it was just literally sold out from under the person who ran the movie theater by the person who owned the land. What's that like? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it was torn down literally overnight. They went, cut the cable. It had sort of this 
uh, inverted dome roof, you know, like a, you know, with all deckers. They literally cut the wires that held it up, dropped it all to the ground, and it was gone. So there was never a chance to even save it. So when we saw the documentary, and I was like, I was so fearful that it was going to end the same way. That documentary, you know, kind of, it led you, he <laughs> led you in that way where you didn't know where it was going. And, well, and at the end, when we saw it, I said to Cindy, I said, now's the time we got, we have to go and support this. And she goes, well, it's saved. And I go, but that's the problem. People think once something's saved, they're done. But the idea is you got to keep, you know, there's all this rally, you know, especially like when, when a storm hits and everybody goes and donates food for the first week. But then four weeks later, you know, you still need food sent over. So yeah. that it, we made it a big deal that you guys, you know, were able to save this thing. And now we want to support it and try to bring it to the next level. But that's our contribution. We weren't able yeah. to help you save it. But once we heard about it, we wanted to support it. And that's that's where we're at now. And your your other hat that you wear with historic preservation, you were invaluable to us when the, the, the more recent crisis came up where we thought we were going to lose the theater. You were Absolutely. on the phone with JT. We were we had just come away from the first town meeting that bought us a little time. And JT got on the phone with you and we were hardcore strategizing and you were incredibly helpful in mounting the battle that luckily we didn't have to completely fight. Thank God. Yeah, because, you know, I took, because, because as town historian for Nutley, I've gone up against a lot of things. And I'll be honest with you, you lose more than you save. It is hard to save something because people just don't see the value. And the most frustrating part, especially with that theater that was in town, is two to five years later, everyone comes back to you and goes, geez, you know, I, I really missed that place. You know, we, we should have saved it or we should have made it a landmark or something. And, and you go, wow, you know, where were you when this fight was going on? So... Uh, I tried to be as helpful as I could, and thank God we didn't have to go. You know, your this outpouring of support was what won you that battle. But uh, yeah, I was willing to help any way I could because I've been there, I've seen it go bad, and I didn't yeah. want it to go bad, especially not after just learning about it. It felt <laughs> it felt almost unfair. <laughs> we really needed people to talk to, you know, more than anything, and to have you there in our corner. Uh, so many people there in our corner, but to have you there with that perspective at that time. It was really, really crucial. Just like we talked about on the podcast before it, it's that fight, you know, that won this situation for us, you know, and getting that word out there, the, the, the choice to get the word out there and share it. Because with that first meeting, like we talked about, the strategy was don't let anybody know. People are going to go crazy. And it, it, by pure destiny, we had that extra time that month to put our all of our heads together and plan um, a strategy for how we were going to uh, save this thing. It's it's just, it, it warms my heart. It really, really does. Um, and Zeneca, obviously, you know, you went through that roller coaster ride uh, with yeah. us. I was actually busy with uh, Joe Bob preparations, so I, I didn't get as, much, as hands-on as I wanted to. Again, another crazy timing thing, you know, another nutty timing thing. The fact that the the drive-in was saved when the king of the drive-in came to town and <laughs> did did that event, it was it, you know just insane. That event was crazy. And you had that uh, amazingly appetizing yet unappetizing uh, jerky shack right outside the oh, yeah, jerky yeah. shack was such which, a which was so you you like look at it you're like that's horrifying and disgusting. What they're selling things to eat in there? Wait, that's yeah. Looks really explain good. Explain your crazy process, Zeneca. Where do you go from concept to you know, the idea when, when, uh, okay. I remember you approached me and said, Hey, would you be into allowing us to do this, to make this little set right by the concession lobby, you know, cause at the time you were part of the production team at that time. Yep. And yep. we're trying to get you as hands-on as possible with all these big ideas that we had for Joe Bob. <laughs> um, but it, it ended up working out perfectly. Cause not only did you create an amazing set, you were able to make this uh, side biz go. Yeah, because of course, you know, as I mentioned with the cake, you know, I do a lot of food stuff. So in order to add something to the event with having this horror theme to it, I came up with the idea of having a butcher stand, you know, like a cannibalistic butcher stand. And then as I was talking with JT, the idea transformed into like, well, why don't I actually sell jerky there? And uh, I think the first night, the Thursday event, no one really believed that we were selling anything. 
because it was so good of a display <laughs> that they thought it was only it was part display. of the show. <laughs> you know, because it was it was me and my family. And so, you know, we're a team of like seven people and we were dressed up, you know, we were in our costumes. Was I was the, the, the uh, you know, I was the butcher and there's, I had a two headed son that was my, my brother-in-law and then a big zombie guy. <laughs> it, 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 we had the characters and then we had the things that they could buy, which was the jerky and spice rubs. And my sister-in-law, is actually big in the Joe Bob community as the mutant mom. And so she teamed up with me on this. And so she made some stuff and I made some stuff. We teamed together to create this cannibalistic experience where our characters can entertain everyone while they're standing in line around us. And so we were trying to play it up and take their mind off of the fact that they're in line for hours. You know, yeah. it's, and, and I think we were very successful at that. You know, we were passing out water and, trying to make sure everyone's comfortable and while I'm cutting limbs of skeletons and things, you know. <laughs> it became essential. It was all hands on deck. It was, it was at moments, pure mayhem. Uh, the idea that we got all different types of elements, we got the insane rain right away. We got the heat, like blistering heat, knocking people out heat. It was a roller coaster ride. And uh, yeah, certainly a lot, a lot of lessons learned in that uh, that crazy role. Oh, oh yeah, and John swept in and saved the day with the creation of a set on the fly. That that was yeah, the, yeah. that was the craziest night ever. Where we had nothing to do for the Mahoning. We're just gonna. I think I heard Mark talk about this one time. He'd like to just go and not do something. So we had nothing to do. We're just going to Joe Bob. I'm in my hotel room. JT calls me at midnight. Goes, John, we got to build a set tomorrow. And I go. What are you talking about? He goes, well, <laughs> this happened, that happened, the rain happened. I go, James, I got I got my car. I, I'm 40 minutes away because we stayed at a really cheap hotel, like 40 miles out of the way. And he, and he goes, you're going to get a call at 1 o'clock. Be ready for it. And then he goes. So I didn't go back to sleep. I'm just sitting there wondering what's going on. And then who was that production guy, that really good production guy for uh, Joe Bob? What was Austin. his name? Austin? Austin, yeah. So Austin calls me at 1 a.m. And, and he he's a guy who is on the move. He knows what he wants. And he's spurting things out to me. I go, Austin, I have a car, no tools, and no lumber. He goes, we're going to work it all out. Show up 9 a.m. tomorrow. And sure as hell, we showed up and it all worked out. And you guys provided a vehicle and got the lumber and the tools. And working in that blistering heat. And Steve, you know, James' brother Steve was a huge help. He came out. Cindy was painting. And... I'll be damned if we didn't get that thing done in time for that. And that was, you know, something's really fun to look at after the fact like that. I look at that as a really fun, at the time I was super stressed, but when it all came together and he was up on that big screen doing the live shots and I could see the stuff behind him, I felt really good. It, it was, it was a lot of fun. Yeah. That pressure, you know, that, uh, that happens almost every single, well, not that extreme, <laughs> but that happens almost every single weekend. I remember that first trauma that we did, James, big trauma fan, wanted to impress their team and really bring the show aspect and show them what we could do. And it started to rain. Yeah. And I could see his heart breaking like, no. And same situation, just like all these stories that you're telling, we somehow found a way to pull together, grab the right tarps, get the things in place to make it an incredible event, like one that people talk about forever. And that Joe Bob event is one that we will be talking about forever. And certainly the people that were there, it's just, it, it's nuts. It's that all for one attitude. But I don't know if it gets more extreme than that, but you were certainly essential in coming up with the idea for the Weekend of Terror event as well, which had Texas Chainsaw theme in 2021. That that one was really fun. I'll tell you, one of the biggest kicks I get is, I mean, of course, obviously watching JT do his thing. He is just a master at working with the audience. This guy just works his butt off for every event. And I don't know where he gets the energy of the time. But one of the other favorite things I love to do is go and take pictures of people online waiting, waiting as long, you know, sometimes it takes a half hour more to get up on that set and to get their picture taken. That is like the biggest compliment ever is when you see people having fun. And I especially like it when 
the people in the concession who work so hard. They rarely ever get to see a movie, especially if it's a big event. When when sometimes you'll see four of them sneak out, the you know the young ones, and they'll get up there, and you'll just see they're smiling and 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 that kind of thing. That makes it all worthwhile. That makes all the labor, all the effort, because some of these sets take longer to make than they're actually up, which yeah. is really yeah. odd, you know. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's become the situation is. We, you know, maybe in those early days, we could decorate the stand with a couple dollar store items and uh, that was good enough, you know, but the production value, thanks to, you know, folks like you, both of you guys is, you know, it's raised. It's really the, and that's kind of the mantra of what we do is every year we want it to be better with our annual events every year, we want it to be better. So naturally, you know, uh, we've been growing year after year and to have you guys in our corner knowing uh, what we're going into uh, with this year it's it's amazing so obviously it takes a lot creatively speaking to get that inspiration and it really helps when it's a film or a series or a fandom that you're really really into we may have done one but if you had your choice to be able to work on a set, something that's going to just like fuel your fire, I'm going to jump into this thing full force. What comes to mind for you, Zeneca? Oh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty difficult because I, since I deal with projections, I could do a set projection set on pretty much anything. I do love it when I can take the theme of my car, which is the zombie outbreak response vehicle, and gussy that up to fit one of the themes. So like when I projected zombies bursting out of the walls and whatnot on my zombie vehicle for Zombie Fest in 2019, that was pretty fun. I, I would say I'm very versatile, so I don't really have one specific thing that I'd like, but if there is a double feature that I'd like to request, it would be Tremors. <laughs> Just because I think Tremors are really cool. It's great movies. That has come up so many times on this podcast. <laughs> I, I think that I could build some sort of grab weight, you know, with my circle display thing. So. Oh, boy. See, now you're planting seeds. <laughs> that, would, that would be one of the things. The Tremors is, is such a great drive-in movie anyway. It is. We joked about Bacon Fest. And <laughs> honestly, like, I say we just start revving the engine, reach out, say, look, 2023 is our year, Kev. Let's do this thing together. Let's sizzle it up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get nuts. Uh, how about you, a, He's got a band and everything, too, right? That's right. what I mean. It's a no-brainer. Say, bring the brothers out. Absolutely. Play at the fest. That's a whole Rock run, out. Yeah. Think about the vendors. Every <laughs> single food truck selling bacon. It's the <laughs> home run. <laughs> uh, how about you, John? Anything pop where you're like, man, this was right up my alley. You know, I don't, I have to say the same thing as Zanica, that there's nothing. I like the challenge of being told what's coming up and here's what we're going to do. Now, one thing that I did go all out for, which wasn't a big thing for the theater, was kind of like we did it on our own, you know, with the car, which the car itself has its own stories. But was when you guys did the thing, the re thing, the, re the double take, the, the, the we thing. Made double take. Take. Yep. Yeah. So we were on our anniversary trip. And we saw your plane. Now, that movie happened to be playing on our anniversary weekend. And it was the first movie that Cindy and I, we weren't dating, but we had an eye on each other. And we went out with a group of friends. It was the first movie we all went to see. So when you had that coming up, we knew, one, we had to be there. We changed all our plans around that. And two, I went and I did as much as I could for that. It was the first time I ever did real cosplay. I don't know if you remember, but I dressed up like McCready. Yes. And, oh my gosh. Yes. And I had this torch and my son made these, uh, these, you know, these uh, plastic things that the pop-up uh, blood monster and the torch had a lighted end on it. And I did the cosplay. And then at the last minute, like a day and a half before the event, I was like, I need something even bigger. So I don't know if you remember, but I made this spider head 
and then put it on a remote control car. That was the stuff remember. of nightmares. <laughs> Chasing people around the it lot. Was that was legend. so much fun. Oh, Love people were come, people were chasing me down. You got to come to my tent site. You got to come over here. And you know the thing kept going dead, and I was charging it. So I, that's <laughs> you've already you've already done it with the thing because that was so much fun, and that that had a move that had that was right at the time of our anniversary. You announced our anniversary for us, which I thank you for, and um, yeah. that was that was just a lot of fun running that head around there, which I still keep. It's in my shop on top of one of my shelves, and it looks out at me every day. And uh, <laughs> that's just a that's a great memory that that you guys gave me. Yeah, that's something that both of you guys bring, regardless of whether you're involved with the big set, the big photo op, whatever. You have a way of bringing that fandom full force. And I always say it like the perfect Mahoning fans because you're willing to come in costume, decorate your car, get your kids involved. Get it's like it's that's what it's all about I think for why people ask like what's special about the Mahoning, you know, instead of uh, versus going to, you know, some somewhere else. I think that's what's it is you have a lot of people like that that are willing to represent in a big bad way. And why don't you guys talk about some of your uh some of your greatest hits when you, when we talk about cosplay or coming uh, and showing off the fandom. Greatest hits, like I uh, dressed as a Data from the Goonies. Oh, um, that was for, that for was of, yes, that was an amazing costume. Was that for a Halloween <laughs> show, or you just came like I'm doing it? That was, I believe, for Goonies and Explorers. I think that was oh for that yes, show. okay, yes. Yeah, so I, I had the the punching glove attached and and, uh, and everything. It was. I also. As expected. <laughs> as best as I could. Let's see. I've dressed up in medieval costumings for the medieval Mahoning event. Um, let's see. I dressed up as Patrick Bateman from American Psycho in order to watch Texas Chainsaw Massacre. That was fun. <laughs> I've dressed up my car a number of times, just like John does. You know, he dresses up his car for the event. Your car, both your cars are legend, but when, we always know when Zeneca is coming on the lot because, like you said, it's the zombie. The zombie, mobile. yeah. <laughs> we dressed as uh, my fiance and I dressed as Rick and Morty for the Back to the Future event. That was fun. <laughs> um, Love it. That's, that's all the ones at the, off the top of my head that I can think of. Yeah, I I do have an amazing picture. Uh, with your car decked out for that Mad Max event. And uh, I take it it's your hubby who is strapped to the front of that car. <laughs> no, that's actually a dummy. Oh, I love it. Yeah, that that's a dummy. That's my blood bag. And I'll be bringing him again this year if we have Mad Max. Oh, yes. We're going we're gonna to rev those engines up. I can smell the fumes already. <laughs> what about you, John? It seems like whenever you're on the lot, your car is it's always in the same spot. And it's always a centerpiece. I, 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 that car thing, I tell Cindy, I joke with her, that car has gotten more publicity than our local congressman. Cause I'll see that thing. On, <laughs> I'll see that on Instagram. I'll see it on post. I'll see it on the newscast when they're, you know, they're doing the save the Mahoning will be in the background. <laughs> so that started really innocent with just, I had this great set of uh, driving speakers that I wanted to try out and then they were meant to be at my house. And then when we started coming up there, I just started putting that out and then I was like, oh, you know, I got this drive-in tray. I'll put that on there. And then you had Zombie Fest the one time. So I put all kinds of creepy stuff on the tray and made up this weird menu that was all zombie related. And since that point on, the car has now become, I call it like the little satellite area. So like I go in like a panic. Like I, I tell Cindy, we got to go because I, I need that spot. If I don't get one of those two spots, we're, we can't get <laughs> up. And that has become to the point now where like people are, if we don't do something, people actually come and go, oh, you, you didn't do anything with the car. I'm like, well, look behind you. There's a, there's, there's a Freddy house behind you that I just spent <laughs> a week on. Yeah, you got the car. Oh, so that's the car, amazing. Yeah, the car has been, been a lot of fun for us. It's a set it. on wheels. That's what it, it feels like. On, so as far as cosplay though, McCready was the only one I did. Cindy and I did come as uh she came as Rook Assault and I came as Willy Wonka last year. Perfection. And the biggest one that I did that I really got into was when you were doing the uh, Spaghetti Western. My favorite, uh, right there. For Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and I, and 
and we had the whole setup, like, you know, we had everything set up and I had the hat and the gun and the, and that was a lot of fun. Cause I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm actually a shy guy. And for me to do cosplay was really, I wasn't sure I was going to be able to do it. And I didn't know, but it's starting to feel a little more natural now, I guess, I, yeah. because everyone's so supportive there. If it was, if people weren't supportive, I would have dropped that in a minute, but people love it and they want to come up and have their picture taken with you as this character. And it's, Again, it's fun. It's the interaction. I get a great joy out of meeting people, and 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 I want them to see the car. And and, and it's so funny sometimes because people will come up very shy while we're sitting there. And go, you know, can, can can we take a picture of your car? And 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 I always want to joke around and go, no, go away. <laughs> Respect my privacy. I, I do I this spent an hour myself. setting this up for me. Yes, this is all for me. Go away. <laughs> of course. So if anyone's listening to this, yes, please come up. And if you want a picture of the car, take a picture. If you want to talk to me, please talk to me because I enjoy meeting people. And some of the greatest people I've met in recent times has been at the Mahoney. It's a terrific family. It's wonderful there. How about you, Zeneca? Well, did we talk a little bit about your experiences at the Mahoney or favorite kind of uh, events at the Mahoney? Beyond uh, ones you've worked okay, Beyond the ones that I've done, one of my favorite events is actually the Indiana Jones trilogy. Oh boy. We always talk about that on the podcast, but it brings up bad memories because it was like the longest night ever and it was super oh, hot. Oh yeah. But it was such a blast. That was just like a lot of these events you guys are talking about. There were these level up events where it's like, oh, we can add this. And I remember that cosplay was off the chain and we didn't promote any of it. People showed up like, ready to go yeah it was great i stayed up the entire time we were having fun unlike john i i typically will park in a variety of spots if i'm in the back i don't wish to talk to anyone <laughs> <laughs> that, if you're back there it, you know why yeah it, it's <laughs> date night <so. laughs> but i'm in the front yeah come and talk to me i've also loved any of the schlockeramas yeah Always stand just out. like shocky films, just love it. And I do really love the the Tuesday events, the exhumed Tuesday events. I go to those a lot because yeah. weekends could be filled with other stuff, but on the Tuesdays I'm usually free, so I will come on Tuesdays and I just love hanging out and enjoying a single feature, even if it's just Terminator Two, you know? Yeah, that's what's been great about those Tuesdays is it's allowed so many people who. You know, they're like, I work every weekend. You know, when we used to be just Friday, Saturday, it was like, I cannot physically get to you guys. And I think the Tuesdays really do add this great element because it's it's a way for people to come out and, and discover us kind of in a, a casual way without this big event involved, even though we've had some really amazing uh, events on those Tuesdays. It's a very close knit group of people that you start seeing all the time you know and that's kind of what the drive-in represents and what the mahoning always was meant to preserve was this community aspect a place where you can come and get together with like-minded people you know and eventually become friendly with them you know i'm sure you guys have made some friends on the lot I mean, oh yeah absolutely oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah i would say that the mahoning is special to us because we're able to expand our friend's social circle. Everyone that you meet at the Mahoning is nice and you connect with them on the social media. You may or may not hang out with them in person at the theater because you're doing your own thing, but that's cool. That's expected. That's part of the drive-in vibe. I love that. It's, it's that experience that in the off season, it's so hard because it's like, oh my gosh, I just want to see my friends again. I just want to get back and have fun again. But, you know, now that we're planning, uh, you know, not not too long from now, we'll be putting our heads together with all the, the nutty events that we're planning for 2022. So uh, we're really looking forward to working with both of you guys. Any other uh, memories or anything else you guys want to share? Well, I do want to say that if you too want to join the decor team, we are always looking for people to help us in these things because there are so many events and we can't cover them all. You know, I can go to a Tuesday and put up a projection or something like that, but there's so many more movies being played now than there was back in 2018. 
And yeah. if you want to join the decor team, reach out to one of us. You know, we're always accepting and, you know, we enjoy your creativity and be creative with us. I love that. That's a great aspect of, you know, what the Mahoning constantly brings. Even our, uh, our lot crew, um, they kind of started getting involved mid-season this year with uh, helping out in any way that they could on the sets. And it just, it, it brings something out. You know, like you said, working on something as a team, seeing people appreciate it. When people kind of either fall into that role or, or knowingly jump into it, it's it's incredibly rewarding, regardless of uh, the turnout. Sometimes that's the craziest thing is I've seen James, all you, but all you guys, bend over backwards, and we just didn't get the turnout that we hoped for. That's always the big. I mean, it's happening less and less now, but certainly in those early years. Yeah, and then we have nights where uh, we didn't expect to sell out, and we sell out like the Tim Burton event. That was insane. We were just talking about it because we're there's something. We're trying to get from Disney that if we put it on the calendar, we feel like this is going to bring out every family that could possibly get here, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what it felt like with the Tim Burton, you know, situation. It's like, I think everybody heard about this and is is now making their way to the Mahoning because <laughs> it they just kept flowing through the gate. They kept lining up. The line was never ending or never getting smaller yep. in the concession stand. It was it was crazy, but there's a certain magic, I think, to that too. And I think the discovery aspect of what the Mahoning brings, more and more people discover us every single year just because the, the social media is so on fire. And that's something that I got to thank you guys both for is there's elements of the social media and our story and all that uh, that really capture people's hearts. But when it comes to a kind of social or viral aspect to what the Mahoning has, nothing gets shared more nothing has more attention even sometimes when there's a superstar from the movie there than these sets it does wonders for spreading the word the good word of what the mahoning is stands for and hopefully all that hard work you guys put in hooks a bunch of new fans i know it makes people's day but hopefully it hooks those fans so thank you guys thank you thank you uh, Mark, anything you got for the guys, uh, ladies and guy? <laughs> <laughs> for, for the assembled. Oh, I've got a special surprise coming your way in just moments. Oh, my goodness. Stops. I see. Oh, it. look at this. Fashionably late, ladies and gentlemen, Mr. James T. Mills. Hey, surprise guest appearance. <laughs> The man who just needed a little help with something one day. That's how I want it listed. And a surprise guest. <laughs> well, James, uh, you certainly are, are the centerpiece of the production team. Why don't you get into some stories you have with, uh, with John and Zeneca? We just went through a ton of great stuff, both about the history with them at drive-ins and their work and contributions to the drive-in. I just left a Chinese restaurant, so you'll excuse me if I burp a little bit. <laughs> He's a pro. He's gearing up for trauma. <laughs> <laughs> no, they both of them just took everything up to the next level. You know, like you could tell by the pictures, like from the previous years. I, I could not have done nearly the type of work that we do now without these two and Jonathan and my brother as well. Having an actual, like, amazing carpenter on the staff is something I couldn't even <laughs> imagine. Back when I was, like, you know, putting up those backdrops on that wall on the inside of the stands, like, to actually have someone who could build the ship deck or the uh, Texas Chainsaw Mask or, like, rack, <laughs> like, torture rack. And then Zeneca with her, proje her projections, which I know nothing about. I don't know anything about electronics or mapping or anything, like, zero on my end and how to do any of that stuff. So, I mean, they're both incredibly talented and I have zero skills in the way that they do in those regards. So I really appreciate having them around. And we touched on it, you know, James, in those early years, it was like, you're putting your whole heart into these set ideas. And, you know, at that time, the immersive stand idea. And it was always a gamble on whether anybody would even come, you know? And there were plenty of times where it's like, well, I guess that's it, you know? in those early years but 
that's what's been amazing about seeing the growth of the production team and James, the way you handle the production team. Because I remember, you know, many a times the frustration level hitting a peak where it's like, I can't do this. I can't be the only one that does this. And we've we've talked about it where it's like, you've got to take on people who are willing to help and get into what we do, you know? And you have found two people, well, certainly the two people on this podcast that are so perfectly matched with not only what we do, but what this family represents. And you've done an amazing job growing into a really great leader. So hats off to you on that. Absolutely. Wow. Yeah. No, thanks. I don't, it's all good. You guys are the stars. No, it really was hard though in the beginning. I was doing it all on myself, but I, I didn't really expect anyone else to be able to do these kinds of things. I thought they couldn't, but it wasn't like I ran anything by you guys, what I was about to do. So like when I would show up to do the turtles thing, you didn't know I was going to turn the wall into like a turtle layer and, <laughs> and all that stuff. You had no idea. Right. It's just, you know, one minute you're there and then it's normal wall and then all of a sudden it's that. And I have a turtle car. <laughs> you don't even know what I was doing. <laughs> and then April shows up and then uh, and then Casey Jones and you're like, what's happening? <laughs> That's what I mean. Like you. So it's not like I could say, hey, I need you to do this thing because you, you don't have no idea what you're walking into any given weekend, you know, so. I definitely needed some creative people around to be able to to do again stuff that I could never do by myself. Yeah, like the the level of these sets, it's like um, what they do out in California at the um, Hollywood Forever Cemetery for those shows. Mm -hmm. That's the yeah. only other place I've seen that does the stuff that we do. Yeah, and you gotta think we've talked about this, James. I mean, I love what they do you know, out there. And the sets that they have are very much like the Mahoning, insane production value for a, a set in general. And James made the point to say, like, they're in Hollywood. They have every single X, you know, uh, set designer there working on those things. It's like, you know, here it's like, that's what I love about it. We're like the little rascals. <laughs> 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 That's what I mean. Like, like we, we just pull talent from all over. Again, nobody has an agenda here. Everyone just wants to put on a good show and everybody be happy. Drive into the lot and see, like, something they didn't expect to see when they got there. So, yeah. Yeah, hats off to these guys. I love it. Uh, it's a team effort, definitely. Yeah, and that's that's what's been great about the growth, you know, is we've been able to take these baby steps, sometimes leaps and bounds, but you know, pace ourselves with the growth and what we can take on. And, you know, that's a perfect example of taking the idea of something an appeal and a draw of something. Cause you know, I remember talking to James about it really early on and being like, this is how the word gets out there. People are sharing these pictures. People are wanting to come to get these pictures. And it's like, you know, a, a huge draw. And for us to really uh, put the uh, time and effort and investment into it, it just, it's a no brainer. So I'm really excited to see what you guys bring to the table this year for sure. Uh, well, we've <laughs> been talking about some ideas, so. <laughs> I love yes, it. Can. Yes, and uh, every single day, things are coming in and getting booked. And we're trying to piece the, the puzzle together. And it's always hard because we want to talk about stuff right away. But, you know, sometimes the bubble will get burst and it's like, oh, crap. I should have never had the, you know, had that uh, train start moving. But plenty coming up, plenty of fun. Uh, any, any questions you have for the guys, James, since you're joining us? I don't know. I guess for John, personally, I'm curious, how, how long was your brother coming out to the theater before you like, found out that he was involved with us the most i knew about it was he kept mentioning your name he goes i got this guy james and he's involved with some production work and it was so ambiguous and so and then the one time he said oh i need a bike because i'm doing crazy ralph somewhere but i i can't explain to you how furious i was when i was watching the documentary and about 15 minutes before it yeah. on, it's <laughs> we gotta tell steve about this place this is perfect for steve <laughs> And there he is on the screen. So I call him from the screen and, why didn't you tell me about this? But he goes, I told you. I said, no, you just said something about this guy, James, and you're riding a bike around. He, he didn't tell me anything about the theater. So that, that pissed me off. 
Yeah, because I, I didn't know that you existed. I, I mean, in no offense, but he didn't really talk about you. And uh... he and I are polar opposites. I can't even believe we're related. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, because he, he's talented in his own way, and he did a lot of stuff before you started coming. So remember that he remember all these sets I would make, and then he and Andrea and you and and Steve, you know, your brother would go and install them because I wasn't able to come up and do any of the installs. So yeah, in those early times, he was crucial. He would, you know, I give him big direction booklets and everything. And uh, oh yeah, those direction <laughs> booklets were works of art in themselves. The the one for the one for the for the Bruce Campbell thing, I keep that. It's in a binder. It is the most beautiful work instructions I've made for everyone, and I, I keep that. I got to bring that up and show you guys because I'm so yeah. now that I've built something, I want it to be put in just. Flat, I get like in James mode. I want it to be perfect the way I built it. So I keep <laughs> directions to Steve, and he still managed to screw one of it up. So. <laughs> That never would have happened. Like that whole idea. I don't know if this came up, but with the Evil Dead backdrop, like that evolved with him saying, "Like, well, maybe you could build the work shed from Evil Dead too." We and touched then, on it, yeah, and, but we didn't, we we didn't have all the details. So, what what's the connection with the original uh, window? Me and Stephen are friends with a guy out in Pittsburgh who has the remnants of the cabin. From Evil Dead 2, he's got the work shed, and he has, like, the window. He's got one of the windows complete. I mean, there's no glass, but everything else. Yeah. So I've seen the work shed. Like, he's had it on display for Living Dead Weekend. Uh, his name is Kevin. Kevin, Kevin that was it. We were wrapping yeah. our brain. I couldn't remember it. Kevin. Yes. But, like, I didn't think, I mean, I thought it'd be cool to get the work shed up there, but I didn't think that he would want to cart it all the way up to heighten so i was like well let's just we could replicate it and since you made that sign for trauma i was like well you know that's kind of it's kind of a big jump to go from the sign to <laughs> doing a whole work shed but but then it was like wait a minute maybe we can get that window and if we get the window like we can't just have a window i mean we could <laughs> <laughs> but it wouldn't be cool it's bruce campbell like, <laughs> yeah and the next thing, I, I did not expect the scope of what you were able to do, John. I thought it was going to be maybe a couple extra feet on both sides, but not like, you know, the facade of the whole front of the cabin. You know, I didn't expect that. That would never would have happened, again, if you weren't involved. We never would have upped the game like that. No, it was a level up. What I love about that is that there was so much work involved that when that event was done, we kind of went, what's coming up? And the, you're like, oh, well, this uh, the, the camping thing. I go, well, this is kind of like a cabin. And we... We must have repurposed that Bruce Campbell <laughs> thing for the next three shows or four shows. Yep. Just Camp by Blood. Changing. Camp Blood. Universal. Then we put the, the, <laughs> Universal, yeah. Oh, now it's a Bavarian cottage. And then you finally, <laughs> you finally stumped me with Freddy House. I was like, well, was Freddy ever camping? Because maybe we could have <laughs> yeah. And you're like, no, no, we need the front of the house. And and that was like the most intense. Like Bruce Campbell was big, but the Freddy house was that's probably the most intense work I've ever put on a thing. But that was the first time that we were able to finally cover up the cabin. But I was telling them earlier how it still pops up every now and then. I, I get to see the cabin show up like an old friend. So <laughs> yeah, I know that it's still there. No, but like I would I would never assume we could do any of these ideas without you. So I, I don't just say, you know, like, hey, we want to do uh Texas Chainsaw like you know what that one I, I I did say well what do you think we could do like what that was one where I was totally like you know what's your creative idea for what you could put together because I don't want to just say hey I need you to build like the Amityville Horror House or something I don't want to just tell you to do that like I want to see like what you feel like, confident that you could do and you're right. willing to put the work in on because I know you know you are you have a full work schedule as it is and it's really hard so I mean and I know if you say you'll do it you're going to deliver the thing you say you're going to do so you know what I mean? It's kind of a big like sigh of relief when you're inspired yourself to do something with your own sense of perfection. Well, that being said, just tell me what to make next time. because that's <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's great because they both mentioned earlier that that's what's so exciting about this. I said, you know, what is the perfect movie that plays into your fandom that would inspire you for the set? And they're like, what's fun about it is like, you know, the fact that it is all sorts of different fandoms and the fact that it is a surprise when it comes. And it is a, you know, it's this element of uh, little rascals, damn it. <laughs> yeah. He's back to that. <laughs> <laughs>
meet us at the clubhouse, you know? <laughs> I guess I'll build that next. Yeah, and, and what's great is that people do actually respond to these things. Like, like Zeneca, I know that your stuff for Edward Scissorhands and uh, Beetlejuice, like, that got, like, thousands-some likes. Like, that, th those pictures got tons of likes. So, I mean, oh, people yeah. really were... Yeah, they're commenting like, oh, where is this at? I want to go where this is. Like, oh, darn, I missed this. Like, that's really what gets people to, like, not want to miss our next show because they saw the fun that they missed on the last oh, show. Yeah. yeah, and because I set up that set design early, we were able to get pictures out into the social media portals fast, and it really did convince people to come by. A few of my yeah. friends that didn't even know I did the Mahoning stuff went to the Tim Burton event simply because they saw my pictures. Yeah. And we were talking about it, like, that's the beauty is like, and we try to plan this where we can get that good photo op to share on the social medias on Friday, because it naturally ignites Saturday, people discovering it. But the thing about the Tim Burton event was that got out there early and literally everybody and their mother showed up to that event where we were like, holy crap, that was definitely the most unexpected sellout. We were expecting it to do very well, but boy, that took an insane jump. I remember, Mark, it was like overnight, too. Yeah, didn't we have like 666 tickets sold in one day? There was a night. I can't remember exactly when, but I did the math twice, and it was 666 tickets. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of perfect. you got to be in league with to get ticket sales. It's all right. That's right. <laughs> Uh, well, we love you guys. We can't wait to get back to work. We can't wait to just get back to the Mahoning and be able to celebrate our love of film and our love of the drive-in. Um, and that'll be coming soon enough. It's been really great. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for Thank having you. us. Thanks for everything you guys do, sincerely. Yes. Thank you, JT. Yeah, you're from, the team leader. From the bottom of our heart and the fans, thank you guys too, you know. Whenever you guys see the vehicles on the lot, you know who they are now. Go on up. Give them a high five. <laughs> give them a hug if they're okay with that. <laughs> don't, take, don't take any pictures, though. Don't take so, any pictures. That's right. Yeah, we were saying. Just for me. Nervous. <laughs> Is it okay to take a picture? No, I spent all oh. this time scram. <laughs> all right. Well, much love, guys. I guess on that note, Jeff, take it away, my friend. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks again for coming out tonight to the Mahoning Drive-In Theater. We hope you'll come back and see us again real soon. The exit is on the right-hand side of the screen at the front of the field. And most importantly, have a very safe trip home. Good night and God bless you.